This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul White This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald Book One, The Romantic Egotist Chapter Four, Narcissus Off-Duty During Princeton's transition period, that is, during Amory's last two years there, while he saw it change and broaden and live up to its gothic beauty by better means than night parades, certain individuals arrived who stirred it to its plethoric depths. Some of them had been freshmen, and wild freshmen with Amory. Some were in the class below, and it was in the beginning of his last year, and around small tables at the Nassau Inn, that they began questioning aloud the institutions that Amory and countless others before him had questioned so long in secret. First, and partly by accident, they struck on certain books, a definite type of biographical novel that Amory christened Quest Books. In the Quest Book, the hero set off in life armed with the best weapons and avowedly intending to use them as such weapons are usually used, to push their possessors ahead as selfishly and blindly as possible but the heroes of the quest books discovered that there might be more magnificent uses for them. None Other Gods, Sinister Street, and The Research Magnificent were examples of such books. It was the latter of these three that gripped Burn Holiday and made him wonder in the beginning of senior year how much it was worth while being a diplomatic autocrat around his club on Prospect Avenue and basking in the high lights of class office. It was distinctly through the channels of aristocracy that Byrne found his way. Amory, through Carey, had had a vague drifting acquaintance with him, but not until January of their senior year did their friendship commence. "'Heard the latest,' said Tom, coming in late one drizzly evening with that triumphant air he always wore after a successful conversational bout. "'No, somebody flunked out? Or another ship sunk?' "'Worse than that.' About one-third of the junior class are going to resign from their clubs. What? Actual fact. Why? Spirit of reform and all that. Burn holidays behind it. The club presidents are holding a meeting tonight to see if they can find a joint means of combating it. Well, what's the idea of the thing? Oh, clubs injurious to Princeton democracy. Cost a lot, draw social lines, take time. The regular line you get sometimes from disappointed sophomores. Woodrow thought they should be abolished and all that. But this is the real thing? Absolutely. I think it'll go through. For Pete's sake, tell me more about it. Well, began Tom, it seems that the idea developed simultaneously in several heads. I was talking to Byrne a while ago, and he claims that it's a logical result if an intelligent person thinks long enough about the social system. They had a discussion crowd, and the point of abolishing the clubs was brought up by someone. Everybody there leapt at it. It had been in each one's mind, more or less, and it just needed a spark to bring it out. Fine. I swear I think it'll be most entertaining. How do they feel up at cap and gown? Wild, of course. Everyone's been sitting and arguing and swearing and getting mad and getting sentimental and getting brutal. It's the same at all the clubs. I've been the rounds. They get one of the radicals in the corner and fire questions at him. How do the radicals stand up? Oh, moderately well. Burns a damn good talker, and so obviously sincere that you can't get anywhere with him. It's so evident that resigning from his club means so much more to him than preventing it does to us that I felt futile when I argued. Finally took a position that was brilliantly neutral. In fact, I believe Byrne thought for a while that he converted me. And you say almost a third of the junior class are going to resign? Call it a fourth and be safe. Lord, who'd have thought it possible? There was a brisk knock at the door, and Byrne himself came in. Hello, Amory. Hello, Tom. Amory rose. Evening, Byrne. Don't mind if I seem to rush. I'm going to Renwick's. Byrne turned to him quickly. You probably know what I want to talk to Tom about, and it isn't a bit private. I wish you'd stay. I'd be glad to. Amory sat down again, and as Byrne perched on the table and launched into argument with Tom, he looked at this revolutionary more carefully than he ever had before. Broad-browed and strong-chinned, with the fineness and the honest gray eyes that were like Carey's, Byrne was a man who gave an immediate impression of bigness and security. Stubborn, that was evident, but his stubbornness wore no stolidity, 
and when he had talked for five minutes, Amory knew that this keen enthusiasm had in it no quality of dilettantism. The intense power Amory felt later in Burn Holiday differed from the admiration he had had for Humbird. This time it began as purely a mental interest. With other men, of whom he'd thought as primarily first class, he'd been attracted first by their personalities, and in Burn he missed that immediate magnetism to which he usually swore allegiance. But that night Amory was struck by Burn's intense earnestness, a quality he was accustomed to associate only with the dread stupidity and by the great enthusiasm that struck dead chords in his heart. Burns stood vaguely for a land Amory hoped he was drifting toward, and it was almost time that land was in sight. Tom and Amory and Alec had reached an impasse. Never did they seem to have new experiences in common, for Tom and Alec had been as blindly busy with their committees and boards as Amory had been blindly idling, and the things that they had for dissection, college, contemporary personality, and the like, they had hashed and rehashed for many a frugal conversational meal. That night they discussed the clubs until twelve, and in the main they agreed with Byrne. To the roommates it did not seem such a vital subject as it had in the last two years before, but the logic of Byrne's objections to the social system dovetailed so completely with everything they had thought that they had questioned rather than argued, and envied the sanity that enabled this man to stand out so against all traditions. Then Amory branched off and found that Byrne was deep in other things as well. Economics had interested him, and he was turning socialist. Pacifism played in the back of his mind, and he read the masses and Leof Tolstoy faithfully. How about religion? Amory asked him. Don't know. I'm in a muddle about a lot of things. I've just discovered that I have a mind, and I'm starting to read. Read what? Everything. I have to pick and choose, of course, but mostly things to make me think. I'm reading the four gospels now, and the varieties of religious experience. What chiefly started you? Wells, I guess, and Tolstoy, and a man named Edward Carpenter. I've been reading him for over a year now, on a few lines, on what I consider the essential lines. Poetry? Well, frankly, not what you call poetry, or for your reasons. You two write, of course, and look at things differently. Whitman is the man that attracts me. Whitman? Yes, he's a definite ethical force. Well, I'm ashamed to say that I'm blank on the subject of Whitman. How about you, Tom? Tom nodded sheepishly. Well, continued Byrne, you may strike a few poems that are tiresome, but I mean the mass of his work. He's tremendous, like Tolstoy. They both look things in the face, and somehow, different as they are, stand for somewhat the same things. You have me stumped, Byrne, Amory admitted. I've read Anna Karenina, and the Kreutzer Sonata, of course, but Tolstoy is mostly in the original Russian, as far as I'm concerned. He's the greatest man in hundreds of years, cried Byrne enthusiastically. Did you ever see a picture of that shaggy old head of his? They talked until three, from biology to organized religion, and when Amory crept shivering into bed, it was with his mind aglow with ideas and a sense of shock that someone else had discovered the path he might have followed. Byrne Holiday was so evidently developing, and Amory had considered that he was doing the same. He had fallen into a deep cynicism over what had crossed his path, plotted the imperfectibility of man, and read Shaw and Chesterton enough to keep his mind from the edges of decadence. Now suddenly all his mental processes of the last year and a half seemed stale and futile, a petty consummation of himself. And like a somber background lay that incident of the spring before that filled half his nights with a dreary terror and made him unable to pray. He was not even a Catholic, yet that was the only ghost of a code that he had the gouty, ritualistic, paradoxical Catholicism, whose prophet was Chesterton, whose clackers were such reformed rakes of literature as Heisman and Bourgeois, whose American sponsor was Ralph Adams Cram, with his adulation of thirteenth-century cathedrals, a Catholicism which Amory found convenient and ready-made, without priests or sacraments or sacrifice. He couldn't sleep, so he turned on his reading lamp, and taking down the Kreutzer Sonata, searched it carefully for the germs of Byrne's enthusiasm. Being Byrne was suddenly so much realer than being clever, yet he sighed. Here were other possible clay feet. He thought back two years, of Byrne as a hurried, nervous freshman, quite submerged in his brother's personality. Then he remembered an incident of sophomore year, in which Byrne had been suspected of the leading role. Dean Hollister had been heard by a large group arguing with the taxi driver who had driven him from the junction. 
In the course of the altercation, the dean remarked that he might as well buy the taxicab. He paid and walked off, but next morning he entered his private office to find the taxicab itself in the space usually occupied by his desk, bearing a sign which read, Property of Dean Hollister, bought and paid for. It took two expert mechanics half a day to disassemble it into its minutest parts and remove it, which only goes to prove the rare energy of sophomore humor under efficient leadership. Then again, that very fall, Byrne had caused a sensation. A certain Phyllis Stiles, an intercollegiate prom trotter, had failed to get her yearly invitation to the Harvard-Princeton game. Jessie Farenby had brought her to a smaller game a few weeks before, and had pressed Byrne into service, to the ruination of the latter's misogyny. Are you coming to the Harvard game? Bernard asked indiscreetly, merely to make conversation. If you ask me, cried Phyllis quickly. Of course I do, said Byrne feebly. He was unversed in the arts of Phyllis, and he was sure that this was merely a vapid form of kidding. Before an hour had passed, he knew that he was indeed involved. Phyllis had pinned him down and served him up, informed him of the train she was arriving by, and depressed him thoroughly. Aside from loathing Phyllis, he had particularly wanted to stag that game and entertain some Harvard friends. She'll see, he informed a delegation who arrived in his room to josh him. This will be the last game she ever persuades any young innocent to take her to. But, Byrne, why did you invite her if you didn't want her? Byrne, you know you're secretly mad about her. That's the real trouble. What can you do, Byrne? What can you do against Phyllis? But Byrne only shook his head and muttered threats which consisted largely of the phrase, She'll see. She'll see. The blithesome Phyllis bore her twenty-five summers gaily from the train, but on the platform a ghastly sight met her eyes. There were Byrne and Fred Sloan, arrayed to the last dot like the lurid figures on college posters. They had bought flaring suits with huge peg-top trousers and gigantic padded shoulders. On their heads were rakish college hats, pinned up in front and sporting bright orange and black bands, while from their celluloid collars blossomed flaming orange ties. They wore black armbands with orange peas, and carried canes flying Princeton pennants, the effect completed by socks and peeping handkerchiefs in the same color. On a clanking chain they led a large, angry tomcat, painted to represent a tiger. A good half of the station crowd was already staring at them, torn between horrified pity and riotous mirth, and as Phyllis, with her svelte jaw-dropping approached, the pair bent over and emitted a college chair in loud, far-carrying voices, thoughtfully adding the name Phyllis to the end. She was vociferously greeted and escorted enthusiastically across the campus, followed by half a hundred village urchins to the stifled laughter of hundreds of alumni and visitors, half of whom had no idea that this was a practical joke, but thought that Byrne and Fred were two varsity sports showing their girl a collegiate time. Phyllis's feelings, as she was paraded by the Harvard and Princeton stands, where sat dozens of her former devotees, can be imagined, she tried to walk a little ahead, she tried to walk a little behind, but they stayed close, that there should be no doubt whom she was with, talking in loud voices of their friends on the football team, until she could almost hear her acquaintances whispering, Phyllis Stiles must be awfully hard up to have come with those two. That had been Byrne, dynamically humorous, fundamentally serious. From that root had blossomed the energy that was now trying to orient with progress. So the weeks passed, and March came, and the clay feet that Amory looked for failed to appear. About a hundred juniors and seniors resigned from their clubs in a final fury of righteousness, and the clubs in helplessness turned upon Byrne, their finest weapon, ridicule. Everyone who knew him liked him, but what he stood for, and he began to stand for more all the time, came under the lash of many tongues, until a frailer man than he would have been snowed under. "'Don't you mind losing prestige?' asked Amory one night. They had taken to exchanging calls several times a week. "'Of course I don't. What's prestige at best?' "'Some people say that you're just a rather original politician.' He roared with laughter. "'That's what Fred Sloan told me today. I suppose I have it coming.' One afternoon they dipped into a subject that had interested Amory for a long time, the matter of the bearing of physical attributes on a man's makeup. Byrne had gone into the biology of this, and then, Of course health counts. A healthy man has twice the chance of being good, he said. I don't agree with you. I don't believe in muscular Christianity. I do. I believe Christ had great physical vigor. 
Oh no, Amory protested. He worked too hard for that. I imagine that when he died, he was a broken-down man, and the great saints haven't been strong. Half of them have. Well, even granting that, I don't think health has anything to do with goodness, of course. It's valuable to a great saint to be able to stand enormous strains, but this fad of popular preachers rising on their toes in simulated virility, bellowing that calisthenetics would save the world? No, Byrne, I can't go that. Well, let's waive it. We won't get anywhere. And besides, I haven't quite made up my mind about it myself. Now here's something I do know. Personal appearance has a lot to do with it. Coloring? Amory asked eagerly. Yes. That's what Tom and I figured, Amory agreed. We took the yearbooks for the last ten years and looked at the pictures of the senior council. I know you don't think much of the August body, but it does represent success here in a general way. Well, I suppose only about 35% of every class here are blondes, are really light, yet two-thirds of every senior council are light. We looked at pictures of ten years of them, mind you, that means that one out of every fifteen light-haired men in the senior class, one is in the senior council. And of the dark-haired men, it's only one in fifty. It's true, Byrne agreed. The light-haired man is a higher type, generally speaking. I worked the thing out with the President of the United States once, and found that way over half of them were light-haired, yet think of the preponderant number of brunettes in the race. People unconsciously admit it, said Amory. You'll notice a blonde person is expected to talk. If a blonde girl doesn't talk, we call her a doll. If a light-haired man is silent, he is considered stupid. Yet the world is full of dark, silent men and languorous brunettes, who haven't a brain in their heads, but somehow are never accused of the dearth. And the large mouth and broad chin and rather big nose undoubtedly make the superior face. I'm not so sure. Amory was all for classical features. Oh yes, I'll show you and Byrne pulled out of his desk a photographic collection of heavily bearded, shaggy celebrities, Tolstoy, Whitman, Carpenter, and others. Aren't they wonderful? Amory tried politely to appreciate them, and gave up laughingly. Byrne, I think they're the ugliest-looking crowd I ever came across. They're like an old man's home. Oh, Amory, look at the forehead on Emerson. Look at Tolstoy's eyes. His tone is reproachful. Amory shook his head. No. Call them remarkable-looking, or anything you want, but ugly they certainly are. Unabashed, Byrne ran his hand lovingly across the spacious foreheads, and piling up the pictures put them back in his desk. Walking at night was one of his favorite pursuits, and one night he persuaded Amory to accompany him. I hate the dark, Amory objected. I didn't used to, except when I was particularly imaginative, but now I really do. I'm a regular fool about it. That's useless, you know. Quite possibly. We'll go east, Byrne suggested, and down that string of roads through the woods. Doesn't sound very appealing to me, admitted Amory reluctantly, but let's go. They set off at a good gait, and for half an hour swung along in a brisk argument until the lights of Princeton were luminous white blots behind them. Any person with any imagination is bound to be afraid, said Byrne, and this very walking at night is one of the things I was afraid about. I'm going to tell you why I can walk anywhere now and not be afraid. Go on, Amory urged eagerly. They were striding towards the woods, Burns' nervous, enthusiastic voice warming to his subject. I used to come out here alone at night, oh, three months ago, and I always stopped at that crossroad we just passed. There were the woods, looming up ahead, just as they do now. There were dogs howling in the shadows and no human sound. Of course, I peopled the woods with everything ghastly just like you do, don't you? I do, Amory admitted. While I began analyzing it, my imagination persisted in sticking horrors in the dark, so I stuck my imagination in the dark instead, and let it look out at me. I let it play stray dog, or escaped convict, or ghost, and then saw myself coming along the road. That made it all right, as it always makes everything all right, to project yourself completely into another's place. I knew that if I were the dog, or the convict, or the ghost, I wouldn't be a menace to Burn Holiday any more than he was a menace to me. Then I thought of my watch. I'd better go back and leave it, and then essay the woods. No, I decided. It's better on the whole that I should lose a watch than that I should turn back. And I did go into them, not only followed the road through them, but walked into them until I wasn't frightened any more. Did it until one night I sat down and dozed off in there. Then I knew I was through being afraid of the dark. 
Lordy, Amory breathed. I couldn't have done that. I'd have come out halfway, and the first time an automobile passed and made the dark thicker when its lamps disappeared, I'd have come in. Well, Byrne said suddenly, after a few moments' silence, we're halfway through. Let's turn back. On the return, he launched into a discussion of will. It's the whole thing, he asserted. It's the one dividing line between good and evil. I've never met a man who led a rotten life and didn't have a weak will. How about great criminals? They're usually insane. If not, they're weak. There's no such thing as a strong, sane criminal. Byrne, I disagree with you altogether. How about the Superman? Well, he's evil, I think, yet he's strong and sane. I've never met him. I bet, though, that he's stupid or insane. I've met him over and over, and he's neither. That's why I think that you're wrong. I'm sure I'm not, and so I don't believe in imprisonment except for the insane. On this point, Amory could not agree. It seemed to him that life and history were rife with a strong criminal, keen but often self-deluding, in politics and business one found him, and among the old statesmen and kings and generals. But Byrne never agreed, and their courses began to split on that point. Byrne was drawing farther and farther away from the world about him. He resigned the vice presidency of the senior class, and took to reading and walking as almost his only pursuits. He voluntarily attended graduate lectures in philosophy and biology, and sat in all of them with a rather pathetically intent look in his eyes, as if waiting for something the lecturer would never quite come to. Sometimes Amory would see him squirm in his seat, and his face would light up. He was on fire to debate a point. He grew more abstracted on the street, and was even accused of becoming a snob, but Amory knew it was nothing of the sort, and once, when Byrne passed him four feet off, absolutely unseeingly, his mind a thousand miles away, Amory almost choked with the romantic joy of watching him. Byrne seemed to be climbing heights where others would be forever unable to get a foothold. I tell you, Amory declared to Tom, he's the first contemporary I've ever met, who I'll admit is my superior mental capacity. It's a bad time to admit it. People are beginning to think he's odd. He's way over their heads. You know you used to think so yourself when you talked to him. Good Lord, Tom, you used to stand out against people. Success has completely conventionalized you. Tom grew rather annoyed. What's he trying to do? Be excessively holy? No, not like anybody you've ever seen. Never enters the Philadelphian society. He has no faith in that rot. He doesn't believe that public swimming pools and a kind word in time will right the wrongs of the world. Moreover, he takes a drink whenever he feels like it. He certainly is getting in wrong. Have you talked to him lately? No. Then you haven't any conception of him. The argument ended nowhere, but Amory noticed more than ever how the sentiment towards Byrne had changed on the campus. It's odd, Amory said to Tom one night when they had grown more amicable on the subject that the people who violently disapprove of Burns' radicalism are distinctly the Pharisee class. I mean, they're the best educated men in college, the editors of the papers, like yourself and Farabee, the younger professors. The illiterate athletes, like Languedoc, think he's getting eccentric, but they just say, good old Burn, he's got some queer ideas in his head, and pass on. The Pharisee class, gee, they ridicule him unmercifully. The next morning he met Byrne, hurrying along Macosh Walk after a recitation. Whither bound, Tsar? Over to the Prince office to see Ferenby. He waved a copy of the morning's Princetonian at Amory. He wrote this editorial. Going to flay him alive? No, but he's got me all balled up. Either I've misjudged him, or he's suddenly become the world's worst radical. Byrne hurried on, and it was several days before Amory heard an account of the ensuing conversation. Byrne had come into the editor's sanctum, displaying the paper cheerfully. Hello, Jesse. Hello there, Savonarola. I just read your editorial. Good boy. Didn't know you stooped that low. Jesse, you startled me. How so? Aren't you afraid the faculty will get you after you pull this irreligious stuff? What? Like this morning. What the devil? That editorial was on the coaching system. Yes, but that quotation. Jesse sat up. What quotation? You know, he who is not with me is against me. Well, what about it? Jesse was puzzled, but not alarmed. Well, you say here, let me see. Byrne opened the paper and read. 
He who is not with me is against me, as that gentleman said who was notoriously capable of only coarse distinctions and puerile generalities. What of it? Ferenby began to look alarmed. Oliver Cromwell said it, didn't he? Or was it Washington or one of the saints? Good Lord, I've forgotten. Byrne roared with laughter. Oh, Jesse, oh, good, kind Jesse. Who said it, for Pete's sake? Well, said Byrne, recovering his voice. St. Matthew attributes it to Christ. My God, cried Jesse, and collapsed backwards into the wastebasket. End of Book One, The Romantic Egotist, Chapter Four, Narcissus Off-Duty.